set it aside for us to come and worship together. Welcome to Green Road Christian Reformed Church. I am Angela Holstag. I'm in my fifth year of Calvin Seminary, and I'm very grateful for the hospitality you have shown me. Some of us have found our way to the sanctuary. Some of us are joining online, and others may watch it later on a recording. But all of us are called here to worship together, and let's hear God call us in an opening. We worship an awesome God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship a relational God who became man and dwelt among us. Jesus held the hands of the sick, came alongside the lonely, rejoiced at a wedding, and called the sinner to new life. Feel his hands on yours. Hear his voice as I read. All who thirst, come to the water. Come, all who are weary. Come, all who yearn for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ has washed over us. And our gracious and holy God beckons us and blesses us. Drink deeply of these living waters. Glory to you, O oh Lord. Glory to you. Let's open in prayer. All glorious God, we give you thanks. In your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You chose us before the world was made to be your holy people without fault in your sight. You adopted us as your children in Christ. You have set us free by his blood. You have forgiven our sins. 
You have made known to us your secret purpose to bring heaven and earth into unity in Christ. You have given us your Holy Spirit, the seal and pledge of our inheritance. All praise and glory be yours, O God, for the richness of your grace, for the splendor of your gifts, for the wonder of your love. Let's sing songs of praise to this great and good God.
tremendous grace that we call the Holy Spirit of God into our presence when he answers us. Hear God's reading to us this morning as I read from 2 Corinthians. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God has come into this place and he has greeted us. Let's greet each other and then after that we'll have our children soon. Hey, come on. Hurry up. Well, what do you know? It's Grandpa with the grandkids. I, I got a hug. Somebody came this morning to help me with the children's sermon. You know what his name is? Lammy. Lammy, of course. Now, Lammy, what was that, Lammy? Oh, he said to tell you hello. Can you say hello, Lammy? You can't say hello, Lammy? There we go. Lammy wants to explain this morning to you what um, Miss Angela is going to say to the us old timers out here. And some aren't quite as old. We're getting there. So, but you'll be in children's church, so you won't do it. He's going to tell you about what it is like to have God's mercy. Okay? So, listen closely. Okay? Listen to Lammy. Can you hear him? Did you hear what he said? Well, listen harder. I heard it, right, Lammy? Okay. Listen harder. Listen closely. Can you hear it? No! Oh, it's getting mad. One more time. Listen very. You don't hear him? Yeah. Did you hear him? Thank you. Lam they heard Lammy. Oh, Lammy is, oh, he's mad. Lammy, calm down, okay? What's that? Lammy said, I need to tell you that he's upset with you that you put him in the fridge. But, what's that, Lammy? He said that he forgives you for your 
really not working this morning because he really had a good, good message to give. And he got angry and he burnt. He says he's really sorry about being angry. But he does love you. Isn't that right, Larry? Uh-huh. He loves you guys. He thinks you're the best. He likes it when you come over to visit by Grandpa's house. But what he was trying to teach you was that he is being very loving and kind and even gracious because you couldn't hear him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's what we're going to learn this morning about God's mercy. And that's what he was trying to tell you. God loves us even though we don't do the things that God wants us to do. Do you ever do that, Larry? Uh-oh. He said, yes. Uh, but God loves us and if we ask God to forgive us, you know what happens? Exactly. He forgives us. Do you know how far that he takes our sins and throws them away? Do you have any idea? If you look out when you're outside and you look as far as you can see one direction and as far as you can see another direction, then turn around as far as you can see there, turn around this way as far as you can see there. God throws our sins Tell him, Larry. Did you hear him? The best part is that he not only forgives us, but he forgets our sin. Do you ever forget something? Hmm? Sometimes I, I go to the shop to do some work, and I forget by the time I get there what I was going to do. So God is just like us. He forgets our sin. So now, Lammy says, okay, he says you may go to uh, your children's church. Thank you for your help.
Our scripture reading today is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, and it is on page 1217 of the Pew Bible. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Creator God, you remind us that the darkness of ignorance and doubt cannot overcome your life-giving word. May your Holy Spirit, who first inspired these words of Scripture, shine your light and once again awaken us to the hearing and the living of your radiant truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul wrote the letter to the Romans from Corinth. Paul did not start the Roman church, nor had he yet had the opportunity to visit. But he pens them a letter that is truly his magnum opus and central to our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first 11 chapters of Romans are, in effect, the first systematic theology textbook. Our text is at a transition and begins with, therefore. Therefore, Paul says, because of all I have just stated, I have just outlined for you the boundless mercy of a righteous God. And there is a logical response to such unmerited grace. And that is righteousness practiced by his people. The remaining chapters in Romans are what we might call Christian ethics. The word ethics is not unfamiliar to us, but it is clarifying here to name that ethics are moral principles that govern a person's behavior. Paul is telling us, I have made my argument, systematically laid out my theology, 
and it demands a response from people who believe. And it is only to believers that Paul writes, because it is only when God's grace has triumphed over his creature's rebellion that an ethical admonition can serve any function. To an unbeliever, Christian ethics often seem restrictive. But the Christian knows that the permissiveness so craved by our culture is not a manifestation of grace, but a manifestation of wrath. Romans 1, 24 and 25 tell us that when we refuse to yield to God's grace, he gives us over to the sinful desires of our hearts. When we exchange the truth of God for a lie, then God permits us to pursue that lie. Sin, instead of grace, is the structuring reality of our daily life. Our text is inviting us to structure our life around grace. Romans 12, 1 again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul has an advantage here. He could say a lot in a few words because those few words are very recognizable by the original hearers in their particular historical cultural setting. Here's an example of what I mean. If I say grounds here in Goshen, Indiana, you might be picturing what is left over after you brew your morning coffee. But if I say grounds in Charlottesville, Virginia, everyone immediately knows I'm referring to the campus of the University of Virginia, always referred to as grounds. It helps to understand. I learned one last night in talking to my host. I said my aunt and uncle lost their trailer in Florida. And she said, no, they didn't. They lost their mobile home. It matters which words you use. I learned that a trailer goes down the street behind a truck. A mobile home is a home, and, and that they're mostly manufactured in Elkhart. So I had quite the, quite the uh, lesson last night. When Paul tells us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, he is drawing on the Levitical practices of sacrifice that would have been very familiar to his readers. And he gets to rely on a single Hebrew verb throughout the passages of Scripture that remain consistent in the Greek translation even, but in the English it's a little less evident. The word is translated in the NIV as offer. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. This word could be offer, present, bring, bring near, and the English changes it, but the Greek and the Hebrew remain very consistent, so it's very recognizable. They would have understood that it was the same word used throughout the Levitical text for when the people offered, presented, brought forth their animals for sacrifice. The priests were instructed by God that the animals brought for sacrifice must be without any defect, and it was their job to examine them. In Mark 14, Jesus was taken, offered, presented before the priests of his day. Verse 53 reads, They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin looked for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death but they did not find any. The priests did their job when Jesus was presented to them. They examined Jesus closely and at length and could not find any fault with him. The result is, when they sent him to the Roman authorities who sent him to the cross, they sent him as the lamb without blemish the fulfillment of the Levitical sacrificial system. Paul tells us there is a logical response, a proper worship to a God whose by grace and mercy we inhabit his kingdom, 
under the everlasting dominion of his Christ. And that is by living a sacrificial life, one centered on Christ and his kingdom, one modeled on the example of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 is clarifying. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were until, as our musicians said, love came down. Listen to what that love did. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Conformed to the world is what we were. Now we are to be transformed by the Spirit of God into living sacrifices, people who can discern God's will and bring pleasure to God. Verse 2 of Romans 12 says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The word translated conformed is in the passive tense in Greek. J.B. Phillips tells us this verse is saying, do not let the world around you force you into its own mold, reminding us that no matter what we may think we are doing, we are not blazing our own independent trail. When we are conformed to the world, it means we follow a pre-printed schematic. The conformed person is built from the ground up on the world's blueprint. My friend has a testimony that speaks to being conformed, and he has given me permission to share his story with you. I will use his words and his voice to tell his story. No matter what you think, you will become like the people around you. You will be formed by the people you spend time with. When I first started hanging out with drug users and dealers, I had no idea how far it would go, what I would end up doing, and where I would end up. It was exciting at first, but the longer I stayed, the more serious the engagements I was involved in. I thought more than once that it was time for me to get out. But the longer you stay, the more you internalize the world's message, and the harder it is to leave. I ended up in a shootout on the streets of Chicago with one man shot through. By the next day, I was in Cook County Jail, looking at the possibility of 20 to life at the age of 19. The one thought I had was, how did I get here? Romans 6.14 reminds us we each have a master. It is either sin or grace. When sin is our master, it distorts our perception of grace. We can begin to recognize these deformations by comparing the world's lies to the norms that God established at creation. Human dignity and the sanctity of human life is a foundational Christian ethic. As beings created in the image of God, we have inherent, undeniable dignity. One way we conform to the world is by denying this dignity of the image in ourselves and in others. Look at history. When we deny the image of God in our fellow humans, we believe the deformed lies of racism, genocide, abortion, misogyny. The list of deformations is as long as history itself. Prior to the Enlightenment, there was an understanding of being bound up to the divine. After the Enlightenment, 
there was still an understanding of being bound up to the rest of humanity. The deformation of our age is that we feel bound neither to the divine nor to humanity, but only to self and a radical form of individualism. In verse 2, Paul gives us the answer, a path to res restoration. Paul teaches us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The word Paul uses that is translated minds is more comprehensive than how we generally think in English of the word mind. It is not only the physical brain, but it's our beliefs and our thought patterns and the behaviors and the attitudes formed from our beliefs and our thought patterns. It is our ethics that Paul is naming in need of transformation. Fortunately, God has given us the tool we need, and Jesus has given us the example. The tool is available in front of you in every pew, and I'm guessing in every home. It is by the word of God that we are transformed. 2 Timothy 3 reminds us that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We are what we put into our minds. The things we spend the most time with will have the greatest transformational power over our minds. Paul is instructing us to be sure it is the word of God. Paul would probably be very disappointed with my weekly screen time report. Do you get those on your phone? Mine pops up every Sunday at about 10 a.m. So it will be waiting for me when I turn my phone on when I get back to my car. And I will have to face how many hours that I stared at that screen. In Matthew 4, we are given a trans, an example of transforming power of the word of God over our minds and then our actions. In Matthew 4, we have the account of Christ being tested in the wilderness. Each time Satan tempts, Jesus responds with scripture every single time. Satan attacks. Make bread from these stones. Satisfy your physical longings. Jesus responds. It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan attacks. Throw yourself off the temple. Satisfy your emotional longings. Jesus responds, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan attacks. Bow down. Worship me. Be in control. Choose your own path to power. Jesus responds, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. By the power of the word, Jesus parries Satan's every thrust. His clear knowledge of the word makes it possible to discern under great duress the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We are not alone. The Trinity is at work in our transformation to Christ-likeness. The Father in his inspired word, the Son by his example and sacrifice, and we are transformed through the work of the Spirit who unites us to Christ. My friend heard the gospel from a chaplain while sitting in Cook County Jail, waiting to be sentenced. He went to prison with a Bible in his hands. By the grace of God, the shooting victim lived, reducing his sentence to 10 years, and he did five before being released. Transformed by the word of God, he attended Moody Bible Institute and is now the husband of a lovely wife and a devoted father to a daughter and a son. He serves as a jail chaplain and I have the privilege of serving alongside him. How does one go from a jail cell awaiting sentencing on drug and gun charges to a flourishing full life? When our beliefs and thought patterns, our behaviors and attitudes are transformed by the word of God, we form habits which anticipate our ultimate future in the consummated kingdom. 
we become a light to the nations, a foretaste of renewal, a royal priesthood. We live as a grateful people. The Spirit and the Word give us life-transforming encounters with the real presence of the living Christ. Because of these encounters, we will be able to discern and do the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. As we close, consider the joyous truth that Paul is teaching. In Romans 8, verse 7, he writes, The mind is governed by the flesh, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But that is not us. Hear how Paul describes the spirit indwelt Christian in verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. You are in the realm of the spirit. The transformed Christian by the indwelling of the Spirit, can and does bring pleasure through sacrificial, transformed living to our holy God. God delights in what we are and what we are becoming as Christians who are steeped in his word and united to his Christ by the Spirit, allowing the transforming of our minds so that we can, that we can test and approve and participate and God's good, pleasing, perfect will. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we give you our lives. May our heart, our minds, and our desires be yours. May our hands and feet and voices move as you would choose. May our moments and days flow in endless praise. Amen.
As we depart from this place, I really want to express my deep gratitude to this church. My friend in Charlottesville said, so what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to a different state, to a church I've never been to, to people I have never met, to do something I have never done. What could possibly go wrong? And then you surrounded me with people like Ellen and Edie and Karen who helped me for weeks putting things together and made me feel secure and safe and at home. And it is a rich and beautiful experience to have worshiped with you. And it will be always a place in my heart uh, for Green Road Christian Reformed Church. And I wish you the very, very best as your new pastor comes and, uh, and as you go forward. So as we part here, the words of blessing that I'll read from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, say to see Jesus now.